So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this. Uh, this is the fourth uh, UCD Newman Center online public lecture. And um, today we have Professor Brian Fanning from UCD School of Social Work, Social Policy and Social Justice. Um, Professor Fanning is UCD's Professor of Migration and Social Policy. He's an academic who studies migration and social policy against the background noise amplified on the internet of xenophobic anxiety and political nativism promoted by some politicians who claim that walls, not bridges, will bring us security, stability and prosperity. Um, he's written a lot on Irish intellectual history with a particular focus on Catholicism in books including The Quest from Modern Ireland, The Battle of Ideas 1912 to 1986, uh, which included chapters on uh, studies, the Jesuit Journal and Christus Rex. And um, Histories of the Irish Future, another book, which included a chapter on the writings of the Reverend Jeremiah Newman on the decline of Catholic influence in Ireland. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Fanning today. Uh, just to let you know that this, um, that this uh, session will be recorded and um, and um, and uh, we will have time for a Q&A afterwards. Um, please, if you have any questions or uh, um, um, comments relating to the talk, then please put them in the Q&A or the chat section at the bottom of your screen. So I'll hand over to you, Professor Fanning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, okay, so what I'm doing today is essentially uh, talking about public morality and shifting ideas and understandings and conceptualizations of this that I think continue to play out and inform uh, debates which we have today. Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America wrote that rights, liberties and toleration provided an insufficient basis for a viable social contract. It was also necessary for the state to cultivate what he called habits of restraint. It did so by passing laws that affirm and enshrine particular norms and values. Laws didn't just prohibit or publish something. These could all also symbolically proclaim the shared va values and worldviews of a community. All societies have customs and social norms that influence how their members interact with one another. And public moralities are enforceable versions of these. Public moralities are as old as the first laws and religious codes enacted by humankind. All through recorded history, social norms and values of one kind or another have been policed and enforced. Those who breach the norms, taboos and orthodoxies of a particular community, church or social movement may find themselves sanctioned, expelled, excommunicated, blocked or subject to a pylon of mass criticism. Public moralities have a coercive aspect that can variously marshal bigotry, bias, intolerance, prejudice and stigma to serve some dominant conception of the greater good or be aimed at curbing individual behavior that is considered to be morally wrong. Public morality finds expression in laws focusing on shaping or nudging the conduct of individual members of a society. It is often concerned with the character or habits and the perceived implications of these for the moral ecology of a society. At various times and places, religious conservatives, secular liberals, and more recently, so-called progressives have sought to impose their beliefs and values on society as a whole. Um, sorry, as I readjust my, my, my paper here. Um, so when I was starting, I was starting thinking about this topic, which is for a book on public moralities, uh, I was initially drawn into this by uh, a figure called Jeremiah Newman, who you know, was the Bishop of Limerick at one stage president of New College, uh, and also a philosopher and sociologist based at Maynooth, who wrote quite extensively about social change in Ireland from a Catholic perspective. Uh, Newman defended the right of the church to use its influence to ensure that the Irish constitution and law reflected Catholic morality. In a book called Studies in Public Morality 1962, he argued that in the Irish case, where most citizens were Catholic, Catholics had a duty to promote laws that accorded with church teaching. As he put it, they had a duty to defend the religious patrimony of the people against every assault that sought to deprive them of their faith. He argued that having Catholic values enshrined in the constitution of the Irish democratic state was conducive to religiosity. He opposed the legislation, he opposed the legislation of divorce and the removal 
of other provisions that imposed a particularly Catholic public morality on Irish citizens, because to do so would be to dilute the Catholic atmosphere uh, of the society in which they lived their lives. It wasn't just that Newman supported laws that accorded with Catholic values. He believed that such laws helped bolster Catholic religiosity. So this goes back to this idea of, 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 of public morality. Um, so where, where do we start with this then? Uh, I, I kind of argue in the book that there, is a, that there is a sort of a taxonomy of public morality that one could, could, usefully, could usefully draw upon. Uh, and this would in perhaps include uh, three perspectives. It would include one rooted in Christianity and Christian ideas, especially focusing on the idea of original sin uh, and an understanding of the human person and character associated with Christianity. Uh, against this, we would posit perhaps the emergence of liberalism, which grew out of Protestant individualism. Uh, and that would have basically challenged to some extent over time, the idea of public morality itself and emphasizing individual autonomy but also could be enforced in itself. You could enforce basically liberal values as a form of public morality, or to use a term with overlapping meaning uh, used by Rousseau, uh, a civic religion. And thirdly, we can see, and I think a lot of the emphasis today is going to be upon the emergence of a, the emergence of a, a new public morality, if you will, a new public morality that basically is very much rooted in, in kind of a psychological understanding of the self. And again, this is rooted in, in Rousseau, it kind of can be seen to develop through a whole range of thinkers, including Nietzsche and Freud, uh, to, uh, that basically, if you will, comes to offer an account of the person uh, and an account of, of morality and the self that basically was, you know, would be shared perhaps in many respects by people who have never read any of books by any of these individuals that they have passed into a sort of a common understanding. Uh, uh, so these are essentially ideas about the self that derive from post-enlightenment rejections of God-given moral law and beliefs in a fixed, in a fixed human nature. So um, to start off then, I, uh, I think the starting place for me always is with St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine uh, is perhaps the person who you know, offers this incredible account that can still be, it's very accessible to readers today, of, of ways of thinking that obviously informed early Christianity, but still basically count as, as political philosophy and so on. Conservative concerns about public morality reflect uh, understandings of human nature as something flawed. Such thinking finds expression in the idea of original sin and reflects influential thought about evil and human nature that we see you know, moving onwards uh, through Christian history, uh, in the Protestant direction out of Calvin and so on. Uh, so the city of God, Augustine's uh, great work of political philosophy addresses the city of man as well as theological questions. Augustine argues that a coercive social order uh, in the city of man uh, was preferable to anarchy and chaos. Uh, Augustine himself became Bishop of Hippo in North Africa at a time when civilization as he knew it as represented by the Roman empire uh, was collapsing. However, his case for a coercive uh, public morality was mostly a religious one. Strict ideas that curb tendencies to sin help save souls from eternal damnation. Augustine wrote extensively uh, to challenge what he saw as the prevailing heresies of his time. As a younger intellectual, he was drawn to Manichaeism with his notion of evil as a force or substance independent of God. And Manichaeism purports to offer a rational solution to the problem of evil. Evil was portrayed as a dualism in which the world was a battleground between a good principle and an evil one, where good men were buffeted by forces of evil. It contrasted the kingdom of light with the kingdom of darkness. The Manichaean dualism embodied good and evil, that embodied good and evil, of embodied good and evil, pardon me, has persisted within past and present Western popular culture. In Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Frodo must destroy the ring that embodies evil. Uh, just as the Holy Grail is sought by the Knights of the Round Table as the literal embodiment of the good. In George Lucas' Star Wars films, Luke Skywalker is counseled not to give in to the dark side of the Force, um, as his father, Dark Vader, once did. Beyond such popular culture examples, debates about the nature of evil has been central to Western theological and philosophical efforts to understand humankind. Now, Augustine's rejection of the Manichaeism was fostered by his reading of the work of Plotinus, who sought to reconcile Plato's metaphysics with Christian transcendence. Plato's pure philosopher as a lover of wisdom 
was essentially on a religious quest to become one with the divine. He had to emerge from the darkened cave, to use Plato's metaphor for the world of material existence, into the light. Plato directed human reason inwards. The physical world was to be understood as a distraction. Plato's metaphysics became grafted onto Christian cosmology. The correspondences between Christ, the manifestations of God's will, and so the archetype, the archetype of all mankind and the Greek idea of the Logos did not go unnoticed by early Greek Christians, uh, such as Paul, who sought to synthesize their philosophical traditions with the new faith. In the Confessions, Augustine locates the question of God with one of submission to inward illumination. Drawing on concepts from Platonic philosophy, he describes his quest to know God uh, as one true, that basically is one of surrender to, to God's will. The best way to know God was through attentive reflection and intense medica meditation. The barrier to knowledge of God was mankind's perverted will. For Augustine, Plotinus' Neoplatonism suggested a satisfactory explanation of the relationship between evil and God. Plotinus maintained that evil had no substance. It was not positively real. Evil became possible because God gave mankind free will. It resulted in willfully turning away from God, from a perversion of the will. Sin was to be understood as a loss, not a negation. Evil was not a material op opposite to the good. It was the absence of the good. From this perspective, Augustine's personal battle between good and evil becomes one between the sinful part of himself that had turned, that, that, that had turned away from God. So this idea basically of human beings as intrinsically flawed, uh, of basically uh, seeking to connect with the divine, uh, of by means of a surrender of the will, uh, is, is quite important to, to, to Christian sort of theology, uh, to be sure, uh, and, and, and basically sets up, if you will, a sense that basically as, as, as the, the people, human beings uh, are imperfect, and that this is the starting place. This is the starting place for thinking about morality and for thinking about public morality. In other words, basically what we need to do collectively to ensure morality. Um, let's just see what I, I'm gonna skip. Oh, I mean, obviously in the written version of, of this paper, uh, there's quite an awful lot on Augustine and quite an awful, awful lot also, you know, on, on other theological angles and approaches. I mean, there would be distinctions between many different Christian thinkers on some of this, but hold on to the idea of, of original sin for the moment. Now, the idea of a sinful mankind, where as Chester one put, put, once put it when he was asked, you know, what would you do about the world's problems? Uh, I would start with myself, I would fix myself. So the world can't be fixed without fixing the self. Uh, and that basically evil insofar as it can be understood is basically a loss or negation and, and something to do with, with, with something that is missing from the self. Uh, missing our absence, that this becomes uh, basically the starting place for, for thinking about moral issues and moral questions and provides across Christendom and then, you know, following the Reformation, an ongoing language for thinking about, about, social, about social problems, about, about basically how individual behaviour might be curbed or controlled by law, by the state, and so on. Uh, the main focus of what I'm going to talk about now is, is going to be the emergence of what could be called uh, could be called a therapeutic morality, a therapeutic morality. And um, let me just get my, my space here. I'm working in a very small cubby hole here. And the problem is, is that I, I don't have a full table to lay things out, but uh, I will be with you in a second. Rousseau, uh, Rousseau would be would be basically a, a, a very a very important a very important figure in in all of this uh, because Rousseau, pardon me, Rousseau had comedy now at this stage. And I just dropped the page in the launch. The writings of, of, of Rousseau uh, 
and other romantics gave expression to a new understanding of selfhood that focused on the inner life of the individual and portrayed the rules, codes of society, culture, and especially those of religion as oppressive. Uh, Rousseau directly challenged the Christian conception of the self and the, convic and the conviction that a coercive public morality was necessary to keep human beings with sinful natures safely protected from occasions of sin. Rousseau, who was born and educated in the Calvinist-run city-state of Geneva, was very much aware of Protestant thinking on sin, human nature, uh, and public morality uh, in his writings on moral psychology, including the discourse of, on the origins of inequality, 1755, which was dedicated to the Republic of Geneva, and especially in, in Emile in 1762, uh, where he described his rebellion against the kinds of education and religious formation that he received, with its emphasis on mankind's sinful nature. Uh, Rousseau directly challenges Augustine's ideas about human nature and rebuts examples given by Augustine by him to illustrate hum humankind's sinful nature. Uh, Rousseau directly rebutted Augustine's claims about human nature uh, more than 1200 years earlier. The, Rousseau's con uh, Confessions. Uh, was a, a deliberate response to Augustine's book of the same name, written to prove that every step away from natural childhood towards a corrupt society was a secular equivalent to the Christian fall of man. Augustine's confessions recounted how, when he was a child, he had stolen figs uh, when he had better fruit in his own garden. And Augustine tells this story to illustrate how children, no less than others, were warped by original sin. Rousseau, in his confessions, describes how he stole some pears as a child, but blamed doing so on a peer that led him astray. Augustine believed that he was by nature a sinner who could only be saved by immense discipline, and that the perverse delight that he took as a child in doing wrong was an example and revealed his own sinful nature. Uh, both Rousseau and Augustine considered that the path to redemption was strewn by many obstacles, for Augustine, the susceptibility of man to earthly temptation made the road to salvation agonizing and difficult. Uh, Rousseau argued that children as they grew up were corrupted and damaged by society. Uh, as put by uh, an article on this, which was by a guy called Robbie uh, Duchensky in his essay, Augustine, Rousseau and the idea of childhood. For Rousseau, moral pollution comes from the toxic mores of modern society that breed artificial role artificial social role playing and a culture of deceit. Uh, the child of nature, pure and vulnerable, requires surveillance to make sure that evil practices and ideas don't enter his mind. Uh, so basically the idea of, of the person as pure until corrupted by society uh, and a very different conception of, of evil, uh, in, in abandonment of the idea of original sin and instead an emphasis on on the idea of evil as external force that comes to bear on an individual. So it is society's fault, uh, not the fault of, of, of some kind of individual moral failure that becomes the axis for a new way of, of, of thinking, a new way of thinking. Um, so uh, what to do with all of this then? I mean, there, there'd be many other thinkers who, who basically will examine the philosophical and ethical consequences of abandoning uh, Christian beliefs. I mean, Nietzsche is an obvious example, uh, and, and and schools of, of philosophers like, say, the British emotivists, who who kind of G. E. Moore, who kind of conjured up ways of living, basically, which 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 basically took a very different, if you will, approach to where morality lay, uh, than say, for example, the Christian ideal, uh, and whose ideas were actually quite close to Nietzsche in many respects. But the um, but the sort of uh, the big sort of the big sort of player in all of this, perhaps, who has influenced how, how basically the West, we, we think of, of moral issues, is perhaps uh, in, in many respects, Freud. Uh, Freud intellectually shapes uh, and then popularizes psychology as an, an alternative to religious approaches to thinking about people's inner lives and internal struggles. So it'd be too simplistic to argue that Freud sought simply to replace the soul and its conscience with conflicts between the conscious and the subconscious mind. Uh, the former, which Freud referred to as the ego, consists of mental activity to which a person has introspective access. One definition of the ego describes this as the felt sense of personal self that arises 
uh, in association uh, with a subset of, 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 sorry, with association with a subset of introspectively accessible activity, some bodily sensations, images, thoughts, and beliefs. Uh, at the same time, then Freud posits an unconscious mind, which comprises of mental activity to which a person has no introspective uh, access. Freud and those he influenced contributed significantly to the rise of psychology as, the Western, as Western culture's dominant mode of introspection, which to some extent displaced the religious care of, of, of souls. Uh, so where Augustine saw conflict between faith and sin, uh, Freud depicts internal psychological conflicts between the superego and the subconscious. Both viewed such eruptions of sexuality as manifestations of breakthroughs of repressed primal instincts. Augustine considered these as inherently sinful. Freud eschewed such moralism, uh, but nevertheless depicted sexuality as something immensely powerful and beyond the ego's control. Uh, so Rousseau and Freud after him replaced the notion of original sin with the idea that human character was something that developed through nurture. Augustine and also Nietzsche were somewhat similarly, were somewhat similarly preoccupied with internal battles of the will. Morality could only be understood as an expression of an individual's will to power or conscious intent, or willingness to surrender to a higher power. Yet Freud, like Rousseau, emphasized the external factors that influence the psychological development of the child into an adult. Freud located the internal battles and jostling influences upon which such psychological development in which he called the subconscious uh, played out. Rousseau hypothesized a natural self that was molded by the external world. Freud depicted one that was shaped by a naturally repressed sexuality. Uh, the, the appeal of therapeutic doctrines was that these, as Philip Reif, uh, a writer from the 1960s, um, who incidentally was married to Susan Sontag for a few weeks, I think, uh, he gave uh, permission to everybody to live uh, an experimental life. I want to draw attention now to a book by Philip Reif from 1966 called The Triumph of the Therapeutic, Uses of Faith After Freud. Uh, and this argues that from a conservative Christian perspective, the rise of secular expressive individual has been a spiritual and, and social catastrophe. So the, the perspectives I'm, I'm going to be talking about now are, are, are ones typically held by conservatives. Uh, often these are Christian, though Reef was not, uh, who, who basically like Charles Taylor, for example, are, are, are considering the implications of, of secularism in particular, uh, uh, you know, kind of for them, for religiosity, for morality, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, while such literatures are, are only part of, this, of the story, the preoccupation with conservative thinkers with social change and with, uh, with what they call, if you will, the spiritual and social catastrophe of secularization uh, kind of shed some light on, on perhaps what many actors in debates about public morality and politics and ideology from a, cons a conservative perspective see as the stakes, uh, I, whilst at the same time shedding some light on sociological uh, and cultural changes uh, that are that basically would describe or perhaps account for for some things that are taking place at the moment, some developments uh, about how people generally think of themselves uh, or how the self or the uh, identity is portrayed. Uh, so I think I think this kind of literature is certainly worth worth looking at. Reef in the Triumph of the Therapeutic in 1966 argues that the archetypical exemplar of the new culture was what he calls psychological man, the kind of individual human being who was morally detached from communal order and rendered, at least in his own psyche, the free agent of his desires, uh, the demigod of his eros and ambitions. This being in turn inhabited a therapeutic culture in which the highest ideal and object of veneration was the self itself, its freedom and its moral autonomy. In a foreword to the triumph of the therapeutic self, Reef cites Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, which in the first stanza declares that the, the best lack all conviction, where whilst the worst are full of passionate intensity. So this pretty much, if you will, gives you a sense of where, where Reef lies in, 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 in his feelings about all of these changes. The future, Reef suggests in his 1966 book, would witness the unfolding with ever evolving modes of self-worship. Uh, somewhat similarly, Tom Wolfe, 
uh, the essayist uh, and author, uh, kind of, kind of uh, architect of the new journalism, who had a you know a fairly explosive and exaggerated style of prose that very much drew attention to itself, uh, wrote uh, you know about some of these developments. It's no accident that this kind of writing begins to appear in the 1960s, uh, you know, with the so-called sexual revolution in play and the so-called age of Aquarius and so on. Uh, so Wolf basically writes uh, an essay called The Me Decade and the Third Awakening in 1976. Uh, and he argues that modern life increasingly revolves around the cult of the self. So this essay popularizes a lot of the themes that are emerging in, in books by people like, like Reef. People come to view their lives, according to Wolf, as a soap opera in which the star is me, or a drama of universal significance to be examined like Hamlet's for what it signifies for the rest of humankind. What had once been an aristocratic luxury, the free time and surplus income to cultivate one's personal identity or a sense of self, now becomes widespread due to huge increases in the wealth available to the average person in Western society. Wolf suggests that the space or vacuum in people's lives created by greater wealth uh, that could no longer be filled by traditional religions had produced a craving for significance. People came to be drawn uh, to social movements, churches, therapeutic fads and cults that indulged their preoccupations with remaking, remodeling, elevating and polishing their sense of self. The vehicle for self-realization might be sexual emancipation, marriage counselling, primal screen therapy, feminism or Scientology, a, a so-called church that promised to empower its followers to unleash their full potential as a human being. And Scientology refers to this as going clear. So basically there are an awful lot of uh, kind of avenues by which people begin to explore uh, their sense of self or this idea of, 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 a, of, of kind of a therapeutic self. Uh, and Wolf says a, in pointing out that a number of religious movements uh, are also engaging in this points, if you will, to a spirit of the age. So it's not that this is strictly just a, uh, it stands in contradiction with Christian theology. It is more basically something that takes place to some extent uh, within Christian thinking, but also reaches far beyond that. Um, it's interesting what Wolf has to say, for example, about feminism. Uh, this could be regarded as, as, as um, my, my kind of as, as, as somewhat disparaging of feminism, but Wolf would argue that, that basically one of the attractions of feminism was that it elevated an ordinary status, the woman as a housewife, to the level of, of drama. One's very existence as a woman, a me, becomes something that all the world analyzes, agonizes, and draws cosmic conclusions for, from, or at least takes seriously. So that may well be overstating things for a dramatic effect, but it kind of gives a sense that basically that, that everybody, or more and more people are attracted to ways of thinking, ideologies, uh, kind of uh, social movements and so on that basically center upon the place at the center a very strong sense of the self that is to be debated, discussed, uh, argued over, and so on and so forth. Uh, and Wolf writing in, in 1976 in that essay suggests that the inhabitants of this new age would embrace the following maxim. If I have just one life to live, let me live it as a celebrity. So Wolf's substantive argument is that the self-seeking social movements of the 70s were part of a third great religious wave of, of American history, one that future historians would probably call the third great awakening. And the first great awakening and the second great awakening were, were basically movements of Protestant spiritualism in the United States. Uh, so basically Wolf gives examples of these of from earlier waves, including the Mormons and other groups like that, the Shakers and groups that emerge. Uh, so what you begin to see is, is basically a sort of a tendency in quite a lot of writing to locate, uh, if you will, this, this kind of, if you will, this kind of focus on the therapeutic self, you know, in, in terms of thinking on religion as something that grows out of religion, as something that stands to some extent in, in opposition to religion, uh, and, and to see it from that kind of vantage point. Uh, a very good book that appeared in 2000, was uh, by Carl Truman called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Uh, so, so Truman kind of follows the, the same sort of contours that I've outlined here. In other words, basically moving from classic Christian theology, ideas of original sin, uh, to the ideas of Rousseau that basically locate all evil as outside of the person, and uh, then to emergence of a successive wave of, 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 of thinkers 
that elaborate on the idea of the self as something that must be tended and, and cultivated. Uh, and and uh, here's a quotation from, from, uh, from Truman from the rise and triumph of the modern self about what came to be called the sexual revolution. And he says that the sexual revolution was predicated on fundamental changes in how the self was understood. The self must first be psychologized. Psychology must then be sexualized and sex must be politicized. The first move is exemplified by Rousseau and his romantic heirs. The second is the signal achievement of Sigmund Freud. Of critical importance to the modern ages, his development of both the theory of sexuality that places the sex drive at the very core of who and what human beings are from infancy and the theories of religion and civilization that he connects to that theory uh, and that he does, you, you know. So, so basically it's the psycho psychoanalysis, uh, the idea that science now basically has an intuitive authority. And the result is that before Freud, according to Truman, uh, sex was an activity for pro procreation or for pleasure. But after Freud, sex is, is it, it defines who we are as individuals, societies, and as a species. In other words, we think of ourselves uh, through the lens of, of sex. So the result Truman claims has been the emergence of a therapeutic self that is answerable only to its desires. This rejects the psychology of Augustine and Christian beliefs that humankind has a sinful and flawed nature and locates evil entirely in the external world. It considers that the traditionally religious influence public, public morality that might seek to curb sinful, unnatural or evil behavior has no place in the modern world. Instead, it tasks public morality with protecting the self against the evils of the world uh, by, for example, demanding recognition and acceptance by society of subjective identities and feelings of individuals, as put by Truman. There is therefore an outward social dimension to my psychological well-being that demands others acknowledge my inward psychological identity. We uh, all as individuals still inhabit the same social spaces, still interact with other individuals, and so these other individuals must be coerced to be part of our therapeutic world. The era of psychological man therefore requires changes in the culture and its institutions. They all need to adapt to reflect a therapeutic mentality that focalizes, that, sorry, that focuses on the psychological well-being of the individual. So Truman seeks to explain the apparent increased emphasis on norms and laws that demand acceptance rather than mere tolerance of viewpoints and identities of others. He argues that present day arguments that speech, uh, that speech that people perceive as harmful to their sense of self should be legal and that this should be legally curbed reflects the influence of therapeutic selfhood. The result has been not so much the end of public morality, according to Truman, but its inversion. Traditional public morality is exemplified by efforts by the state churches and institutions seeking to police the moral lives of people. Therapeutic public morality, by contrast, exemplified by an individual right to define oneself uh, and how this might be recognized by society. It breaks with liberal ideas of liberty uh, that understand individual auto that, uh, that understand autonomy in terms of the right to free speech because it advocates curbing speech that might challenge somebody's subjective sense of self. Examples of therapeutic public morality might include demands to prosecute or deplatform somebody who expresses views that are seen to be triggering or to erase somebody's identity merely because these challenge that person's own sense of self. The case for therapeutic public morality is rooted in wider understandings of human psychology, physical well-being and mental health that have mostly sidelined religion. These have deepened understandings of what constitutes harm and widened definitions of oppression and violence to include forms of symbolic violence, such as hate speech, that have begun to influence legislation and how this is being implemented. Therapeutic public, mor public morality has eschewed the biblical language of good and evil, but it similarly uses stigma to challenge what it perceives as deviant behavior. The language of psychology has come to some extent to replace that of religion. The influence of Freud can be seen in how the word phobia has come to be used to describe a range of social and political attitudes that are deemed to injure other people. For example, widespread prejudice against uh, homosexuality has only very recently uh, come to be challenged by the concept of, of homophobia. Uh, 
uh, and you know homophobia would be regarded as you know a social pathology. So what we're seeing here, according to Truman, is the emergence of, of, of the therapeutic self that recognizes no borders. And I think this is this is quite an important one. I think this gets to the very heart of some of the, the frenzied debates that are playing out at the moment. So what do we mean by harm? What do we mean by the harm of others? Uh, since the 17th century, uh, you know, since the emergence of liberalism, which we associate with figures like, you know, um, Locke and Milton and others who were essentially Protestant uh, religious thinkers, uh, you know, who basically at a time, you know, after the Reformation, when there were considerable disputes and, uh, and, and quite rough and tumble stuff between various Protestant sects and churches, you know, argued for the concept of, of tolerance, or indeed the idea of mere tolerance, the idea that, you know, you, you, you should guess to profess your own faith, but you have to put up with the other guy's expression of what they have to say, and you didn't have a right to, to, to shut that down. And you had to put up with, with the expression of ideas and beliefs that you did not agree with. Now, can I say that that, 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 that was always bounded? So in other words, basically the idea of tolerance uh, pushed by people like Locke and others subsequently who were mostly Protestants would have excluded Catholics. There were some ideas that were simply beyond the pale, but there was a sense that basically tolerance was, was part of what would be described as an emerging liberal philosophy of putting up with the free expression of the ideas of others. Perhaps the great thinker in all of this, of course, is John Stuart Mill, who kind of argued basically for a, a free marketplace of ideas and argued that we all benefit when ideas are allowed to freely circulate. At the same time, there was a limit to free speech. Uh, free speech was bounded by it, 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 it harm. So there were various definitions of harm that have been debated and discussed, you know, uh, kind of in uh, certainly in court cases over, over, the, over the last couple of centuries. Uh, from Mill's point of view, kind of harm, harm, you know, harm was something that injured another person. Uh, you know, from the, the point of view of the courts, there were kind of rulings which basically argued that free speech was, was fine, uh, but there were limits to free speech. There was no shouting fire in a crowded building, as one famous court ju judgment put it, on the basis that free speech could occasionally cause harm towards others. So what we mean by harm, basically, according to Truman and according to others who write about the emergence of sort of the third the therapeutic self, or it's it, 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 it's basically the idea of harm has, has basically shifted to include things that cause psychological harm. And this, you know, seems to be bound up with uh, the idea, the idea that basically evils are to be found in the world. So in other words, basically evil ideas, evil thoughts of others, uh, the expression of views which might, which might undermine one's sense of self, uh, these can all be, these all have been kind of to some extent reconstituted as expressions of harm in, in ways that perhaps would not have been understood some generations ago. So basically Truman argues that, that, this, is, that this is very much part of, this is very much part of the sort of terrain that we find ourselves, we find ourselves in at the moment when debating uh, kind of cultural and moral issues. So it's not simply the case that we've moved from according to the various writers I've spoken about and according to the debates I'm trying to reflect briefly on, uh, is we've moved from basically a sort of, if you will, religious conservative view to a secular point of view. Writers like Charles Taylor kind of, kind of wrote about this extensively uh, and wrote about different kind of modes and types of secularism. And yes, it came to pass that, if you will, we saw the, 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 the prominence of versions of secularism that had no time for at all any kind of religious idea that was utterly willing to be you know, dismissive of, of religious ideas, uh, you know, in, 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 in the public sphere. Uh, so basically saw these as ideas that essentially had, had no place anymore. So a form of liberalism that could indeed be intolerant, but it's not simply basically a, a battle, uh, according to thinkers, according to thinkers like Carl Truman, between basically religiosity and, and secularism. It's also now one between liberalism, in other words, the liberalism that grew out of Protestantism, uh, which basically found space for, basic, for, which, for, for, for free speech, for tolerance in, in the context of the expression of religious beliefs. And of course, also religion, sorry, liberalism was this great, if you will, challenger of ideas of public morality. You know, the liberal, the kind of liberals would have taken positions that would have challenged certain ideas of public morality uh, and would have campaigned for forms of individual freedom that would have exempted people from following rules designed to, if you will, uh, enshrine in, in a certain ideological or religious view, but mostly religious ones at the time. 
What writers like Truman and others now trying to commentate and understand present day culture war suggest is that basically the warfare is asymmetrical. You have conservative ideas, yes, and in the United States, they're, they're hugely influential. Uh, we can see the influence of American conservatism on debates such as abortion and so on. We can see American politics as a kind of a knife edge where uh, Republicans might win the next presidential election, Democrats the one after it, and so on and so forth. We can see the, 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 the kind of breakdown between red and blue states. But when we come to Europe and Ireland also, we see a, a sort of a scenario within which basically uh, secularism has broadly speaking won out. It has become a comfortable, uh, the, comfort, the, the perspective of a comfortable majority. But within that then other things are taking place. So what we see according to, to Truman in particular and others is we see quite, a, quite an emphasis on kind of therapeutic accounts of the self. Now, when I began this project, which mostly focuses on practical case studies, so I look at issues like prohibition, abortion, uh, gender and sex kind of identities and rights issues uh, and, and other controversies. Uh, you know, I kind of was start thinking, OK, public morality, but public morality for me it comes back to one's understanding of the self. So what kind of account of the self is one is one offering here? So the idea of the account of the self offered by St. Augustine is very different from that offered by Rousseau. The one offered by Rousseau sets us on a direction and brings us on to, to, to ones we have at this present day. Now, the, the point basically that can be found, you know, kind of in, in people like uh, Carl Truman and others are that has taken from them. What's really helpful there is that you get a sense of why uh, there is such an impetus now for progressive public moralities. So the idea, you know, the idea that there should be, if you will, a public morality that enshrines religious values is something we've experienced very much in Ireland, where you know, laws and, and constitutional provisions reflected religious values and were designed in a sense to bolster these. And if you read the writings of people like uh, sort of, uh, Jeremiah Newman, uh, you know, a Catholic thinker who was writing about this in the 60s and later on, their view was if you took away those kind of Catholic laws, that the whole house of cards would fall down, that it wasn't enough, basically, these, these laws didn't just reflect beliefs of people. They kind of created a sort of a moral climate which assisted people to hold certain beliefs and to practices and to live their lives in certain ways. Now we see kind of a situation perhaps where there are new drives towards public morality. The, 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 the phrase used by Tom Wolfe uh, called the third awakening is, is used by many writers now. He seems to have coined it. Uh, but people talk about it in terms of uh, awakening in the sense that people talk about people being woke. Uh, in other words, connecting a, a lot of the sort of ways of thinking about what ought to be done, the role of the state, the role of law, uh, the imposition of public morality, uh, he, 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 you know, as, as, as practiced or understood by some progressive people, as having more than a few similarities to the ways of, that, that basically religious people and religious actors uh, used to go about it back in the day. Uh, so there is a sort of continuity here. But finally, just to finish up on this idea of an asymmetric thing. So it's not just that we see a battle between conservatives and liberals. It's that we sort of see basically, uh, we, see, we see basically the decline of conservatism in, in, in many Western countries, including Ireland. Uh, so whilst there are you know, a significant number of people who certainly cleave to, to say some conservative or Catholic values, uh, the overall language of the day, uh, the focus of debate, uh, the conceptualization of what's right or wrong, uh, you know, kind of ha has shifted uh, towards ideas that can be best understood as forms of emancipation related to the idea of the self uh, and, 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 and the therapeutic self. Um, so coming back and finishing finally with this, this one more reference to Rousseau, Rousseau's idea that evil and sin exists in the world means that basically the therapeutic self can be, can be minded uh, by basically expecting the world to change. Now, these are, just, these are just kind of, if you will, uh, aspects of what's going on. They by no means account for, for everything that goes on, but they certainly throw up some conundrums, not least, how do you manage a society where everybody needs to be protected from everybody else, conceivably, and, and, and from all harm elsewhere? So it, it does set up some conundrums that would, would have to be worked through. And my own view is that, that you know, much of, of what we associate with the therapeutic self is, of course, of benefit. Uh, you know, because it responds to, if you will, how people think of themselves, conceptualize themselves and so on, uh, and therefore speaks to them uh, and therefore is aimed at meeting, meeting their needs as they live their lives. So there, there, are, there are positives to all of this. 
Uh, but I don't think that, the, that, that I, I think that there'll be ongoing battles and disputes about working out the ground rules, uh, particularly in relation to the relationship between sort of therapeutic public moralities or the idea that we should be imposing certain moral views uh, uh, and, and say liberal ideas, which argue that individuals should basically have kind of, you know, as much free speech uh, as possible and that all we need to do is to be tolerant of one another. So this has been a bit garbled and a bit confused. And I'm sorry for dropping the pages a few times, but what I'll do now is I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, there's obviously much, much more to this topic. And I just hope I've given you a flavor of some debates that I think are quite important in trying to, if you will, conceptualize or think about the backstories about what's at stake from different points of view uh, in the so-called cultural wars of our, our, our present time. Uh, okay, so chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Professor Fanning, uh, for that talk. Excellent talk. Um, so I invite any of our uh, participants listening or, or, and or watching to um, pop any uh, questions in the chat or Q&A uh, functions at the bottom of your screen. If you just hover your, um, your, your mouse or your pointer over the screen, you'll see that appear at the bottom. So you can ask your questions in the chat or Q&A, and then I will uh, transmit them to uh, Professor Fanning. Um, I might take, as usual, the chair's privilege and uh, and raise one myself, if that's okay with you, uh, Brian, if I can ask the, the first question, just so we await any others. Um, so I, I, I really was very interested in your way of setting out the, I think it's a really interesting way of setting out the different phases of the relationship between self and public morality. And I think it's very, it's really fascinating to think about the ways in which the current conception of public morality as a as having the duty to defend the individual's ability to express themselves and to develop their own self identity can be seen as a kind of um, natural follow on from the uh, previous, um, as it were, enlightenments, if you like to call them that. Um, particularly with respect to re religious uh, thought and, and, and the Protestant, uh, uh, the impact of Protestant um, thought on, on American public life. Um, I, I had a sort of a question. I, I think there's a, there's a, the, the, there's a way in which people who are opposed to, so it struck me that um, the the reference to the thera therapeutic self as a as a as a key concept in explaining the contemporary debates that we're having struck me as one uh, 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 and 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 in in combination with the idea that um, evil is now evil is seen as a kind of feature of the world and the self something to be protected from that it struck me that 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 could be thought to play into a kind of um, conservative or, or a kind of critique of, you know, uh, of, of contemporary public morality, which, which says that, um, you know, pe people have, which, which I think would agree in some ways with the, with the, with the, with the transform, you know, in, in terms of the, the stages of transformation, they would say, look, you know, we had public morality, which, which, put limits, legal limits on people's behavior and enforce certain sort of moral principles. Now we've erroneously, and we, and we realized that some of those legal sanctions prevented people from developing their true identities in, cer in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But now we've erroneously shifted the focus too much onto um, protecting the self from any kind of perceived harm or the, the person. Um, and, and and that's and and that's and, and 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 therefore the the solution is to as it were rebalance in some sense. I think that's the kind of argument one does find. Um, but I, I wondered whether there's a sort of response to that and what you think of this response, which would say something like, well, it's wrong to say that contemporary public morality identifies evil as something worldly, as some, rather it identifies a harm in the structures of institutions and in um, ways of 
speaking and uh, uh, certain rules and, and conventions that are, of course, created by people. They're, so they're conventional, um, yeah. but they encode some of the um, some of the biases and prejudices of the people who constructed them in the first place. Um, yeah. So you might, you might think of criticisms of the legal system, for example, as being, you know, when people say the US legal system is racist, they don't mean that in just that individuals within the legal system are racist. And they don't mean that racism is, as it were, a pathology of external to any person. They mean that racism is encoded in the system itself. And I, and, and I, and I wonder what you'd say to that way of spinning things, because it seems slightly mm -hmm. different from saying that the harm is located in the world and not in people. Rather, it's saying the harm is located in created structures or something like that. Okay. First of all, I'm a sociologist, so I tend to think in terms of the very ideas of social structure that you've just outlined there. Yes. Uh, and if I was kind of, you know, you could see colloquialism such as to explain how you know, racism could be baked into institutional practices, as in it, it kind of, without, no, without anybody's conscious intent, nevertheless, those institutions basically reproduce certain kinds of bias and so on and so forth. And yes, we can fix or amend those according to our will if we put the energy into understanding how these things work. Uh, and the way I teach my course on migration, which includes quite a lot of focus on racism, is I tend, we need to approach it not just to theory, but almost as a plumber would. Mm. You know, how might we change and modify a system slightly to produce a better outcome? Yep. You know, putting our heads under the sink and, and literally trying to ensure that basically people have a better opportunity at jobs, uh, lower rates of infant mortality, live longer, less likely to be arrested by the police, less likely to be, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So absolutely yes. Uh, at the level of at the level of ideology, there, there there are several different things going on. Certainly, the idea of a therapeutic self is only part and parcel of a thing. It's only it's only one strand of of many different things. There there have been many different attempts by social scientists and others to try and explain what we mean by modernity uh, and how things have shifted, uh, and and this is certainly part of it. Um, so in terms of evil located outside of the self uh, versus basically a, a kind of accounts of evil that basically blame people. Uh, so, for example, if I'm teaching about the 18th century in terms of the history of social policy or the 19th century, and I talk about a figure like Malthus or various uh, Anglican religious figures who influenced Malthus and what became the population question. I argue that they would, in their time and place, would have had very, very strong reasons for wanting to stigmatize certain sexual behavior and other things, because they would have seen that as resulting in, in births that would have led to children starving, to an existential crisis, and that the only way out of this or the only way through life for most people was incredibly disciplined, prudential behavior. Uh, so basically, and you get that at the church, but you'll also get it through law, and you'll get it from the magistrate, and you'll get it by being stigmatized if you, if you break the rules of the community. So, so, so certainly, so that's basically, if you will, how that sort of stuff gets embodied in social practices. Uh, so certainly it's in that kind of context that the idea of uh, the individual, the failing individual, the individual who is morally at fault uh, and therefore to be to blame for certain of the problems that they experience in their life. I mean, if you can think of it as kind of an account of, of, of a philosophical claim or you can think of it as a pragmatic claim. In other words, basically, this is something that by and large holds true for a lot of people, except when people get rich. Uh, so basically, one of, the, one of the arguments made by Reef was that, and Wolf and people, that the people are now getting rich. They have luxuries. They have scope to maneuver. They can afford what some right-wing columnists are now calling luxury beliefs. They can believe in certain things. They have the time to ponder this, and they have the time to focus on themselves and to curate themselves in new ways. Uh, so basically, in a sense, this is a product of, of people being faced with different kinds of problems, not existential problems about living or dying uh, and living according to a very narrow sense, kind of set of rules imposed very strictly by a society uh, that, that also basically follow the contours of Christianity, but basically having opportunities to be individuals in ever so many ways, in ever so many domains and find themselves something at a loss as to how to deal with that. But then, nevertheless, the world has to come to somehow to understand that the kinds of people, the kinds of personalities, the kinds of selves that we have now are actually somewhat different from those of our, our ancestors. Uh, in terms of we're differently configured, we may believe in certain things. But to go back to your question about believing in something, irrespective of whether or not 
institutional practices are, are, are to be viewed as the outside. I think for all intents and purposes, they are. Because basically you can blame things on the state. You can blame things on, 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 on any kind of institutional setting. You can kind of say, you know, uh, I mean, progressives will do this all the time in the sense that they'll blame neoliberalism for everything at the drop of a hat. Neoliberalism gets invoked. Now, for, for certain people on the right who are mostly writing punditry around this and, and taking some of these ideas and running with them from the right to the point of view of, of, of the right, you know, all these sort of, the, these, the, the progressives are just the manichees again. You know, they're, they're, just, they're just this crazy idea of what constitutes the evil in the world and they're projecting it onto all these situations as ideology uh, and, and that's just something they do. Uh, but it doesn't make an awful lot of sense that basically uh, to come out from another point of view, to, to, if, to live a good life is to take more responsibility for oneself uh, and so on and so forth. So you know, at the heart of this are, are fights between kind of ideas sincerely held by different groups of people, sociological norms that people are looking for languages uh, to describe them with. So the language of psychology is a relatively new one for me. Uh, it's the language of sociology is one that I know very well. Uh, people like Charles Taylor will basically use a slightly different language to talk about in terms of theology and, 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 and so on and so forth. So all of these are all of these different isms are all these academic disciplines are telling parallel accounts of the kinds of changes we're doing. But what really intrigues me about some of this is basically the expectations that people would have you know, in, in this present time uh, uh, about uh, how the world should respond to themselves. Now, someone like Nietzsche would say, isn't this absolutely fantastic? This is a will to power. Here we are expecting the entire world to bend to us. How powerful and wonderful is that? It is pretty powerful stuff. So therefore, you know, as somebody who is a progressive would typically refer to all of the ideas that would be kind of, if you will, could be used as examples of this. They would all be described as emancipatory ideas. So there are all these ideas that are emancipatory. Why, why are they emancipatory? Because they emancipate the self. They're about articulating and, and creating conditions within which individual selves or beings can achieve new possibilities, ones their ancestors couldn't even envisage, and basically expecting the world and its institutions to, to bow down to this. Now, uh, you know, I, I don't think this can be put back in the box. And I think that the, the kind of, as you ended up there, the, the, the impetus to balance this it, it will be there all the time. So, for example, I can see debates where at the moment where, yeah, I would be in favor of a bit of balancing in the sense that maybe we need a little bit more focus on individual rights, free speech here in some contexts. But I think no matter what happens, that this is a train that is going to keep on running and running and running and running and running. Uh, I was basically uh, very struck by a conversation I, I, I watched on YouTube between Carl Truman, who is a who is an evangelical preacher as well as a, an early church historian. And, and Albert Moher, who's one of the key figures of the Southern Baptist Con uh, Convention. And they were talking about uh, Truman's book. And they were talking about how, if you will, many of the ideas uh, associated with the therapeutic self were, were, were to be found everywhere in their own communities uh, and amongst their own children, because how could they not be? Because those children were part of the world. Uh, so I I I in a sense, you, you see perhaps the, the kind of, you see here and there in the margins, people trying to basically say, can we exempt ourselves from all of this? Uh, examples include Rod Dreher's, uh, the Benedict option and the idea that maybe we, we could kind of create these kind of Benedict monasteries of the future. We can isolate ourselves away from the psychological therapeutic self, these different ways of thinking about the world, identity, all of this kind of stuff. But the reality of it is, is that we're going to continue to have to tease through and think about these things. And the chances are that what some people call a therapeutic self or, or therapeutic individualism is, is, is only one step or stage in an ongoing journey of how human beings think about themselves in the West. But there's another point I want to finish on before throwing it back to you, is that this stuff is mostly playing out in the West. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, it is basically an outgrowing of, 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 of Western religion and Protestantism in particular, individualism. Uh, it is bound up basically with the, with, the, with the sort of wealth and opportunities of the West. Uh, it's bound up with uh, ideas of Christianity within which basically the idea of the individual was concocted in the first instance, by which I mean the individual responsible for their, for, 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 for personally responsible for themselves. So lots of people who are anthropologists have looked at say the differences between say, you know, kind of what the Christian world did to authority. It, it placed the individual with their relationship with God and the responsibility to God in the place of basically uh, worship of the family. Yeah. In other words, you know what I mean? Sort of household gods, which were much more common. So if we look at Confucianism or something of that nature, 
we're seeing a very different sort of relationship, a very different idea of what an individual might be, its relationship with others. But what we're seeing in the West is both is kind of something that has become a secularized version to some extent of, of, of an individual's accountable soul uh, to, to a soul that is no longer accountable, uh, that basically now thinks differently of evil uh, or has a very, very different view as to how the world works. Uh, you know, we're also bound up with the kind of, obviously the theories of Rousseau, you know, and, and Rousseau's idea of, of, of a, a kind of child of nature kind of stands as an axis of so many ideological discussions between left and right uh, and so on and so forth. So clearly there are any number of ideas and debates taking place. But to think in terms of battles about public morality, which I think that's what the culture wars will ultimately be about, about, you know, is homophobia a moral problem? You know, yes, it is now. It wasn't 20 years ago. And the word wasn't coined before a certain point. Now, that, this, this is probably all a very good thing. Uh, but the point of it is, is that we're now basically coming up with a very different conception of, of morality. The idea of hate crime, something that interests me as somebody who works on racism and other topics, the idea of a hate crime. Uh, the idea that basically we should perhaps, should, so should we respond to somebody merely because they express a hateful value as distinct from personally hurting me or personally discriminating against me or personally committing an act of violence against me? These are debates that we're having. And what we're seeing is that organizations that would once have taken a very liberal view, like the ACLU in the United States, which basically stood up for the right to free speech of trade unionists and so-called communists, but also backed cases by KKK members arguing that we couldn't have free speech without free speech for everybody. So they were willing to protect the free speech of reprehensible people. You won't see progressive movements advocating that anymore. You won't see Amnesty doing that anymore. You won't see ACLU doing that anymore. Uh, because essentially they have come to align their, their, their progressive agenda, you know, with, with basically a, a version of public morality that no longer finds place for liberalism. Liberalism was fine when it was come to breaking with religious public morality. But now that religious public morality, those links have been sundered, yeah, you don't, you, you, liberalism just gets in the way of perhaps moving forward with one's conception, or newer conception of what a public morality might look like for the 21st century from a progressive point of view. Mm, thank you, Brian. That's fascinating. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a, a, a question in the comments, which I'll read out to you. Uh, where should the line between acceptance and shame be drawn? How do we allow diversity of opinion without censorship of either side, i.e. the rise and phenomena of cancel culture? What would someone like Truman think of cancel culture? Oh, he would—he's appalled by cancel culture. Uh, but the th but the answer to your question, uh, uh, person out there in the audience, is that uh, your, your your view of this has to be at least as good as mine, and mine has to be has to have no more weight than yours. So, in other words, basically, uh, I would lean towards, I would lean towards free speech, uh, except where basically it is injurious and harmful to a person. Uh, clearly, uh, I'm not a fan of hate speech or racist speech, uh, but there was a debate at a conference I was at yesterday about whether a certain lecturer at DCU who has been associated with these kind of certain views that would be regarded as unsavory by people who are, you know, about Black Lives Matter and so on, whether that person should have their, should be removed from their job as a university lecturer. So, you know, these are very, very big issues, and I think that they're, they should be treated very, very seriously. Uh, I, I think basically the checks and balances between individual rights. Uh, and, and rights to free speech are useful. I think the concept of tolerance will become very useful to us in the future as an armor, because it, it, you know, when, we, when we feel very intently and very sincerely, and these are beliefs all sincerely held, whether you're, you're, if you're a religious person and you have ideas about you know, implementing a religious public morality or you're very progressive and you have, you'll, have, you'll be sincere. So the sincerity of people and, and what they're trying to achieve, that's not in question. The problem is, is basically is how in a society, in a complicated society, do we manage different people's ideas of the good? Uh, and I think that liberalism has the best playbook for this. I think at the same time, we need to take account of structural inequalities. All the academic literature on public morality so far is about the courts. So the standard way of teaching about public morality uh, include things like HLA Hart's, Herbert Hart's book uh, on, on, on Wolfson, on the decriminalization of homosexuality in Britain. And what Hart pointed out in that book is that homosexuality was decriminalized, you know, early, decades before basic, uh, at a time when the society was still very homophobic. And Hart made the distinction between a change in the law and a change in underlying values. Now, I think ultimately in democratic society, we take our cue from the values of the majority and they do shift over time. 
uh, and they do therefore have a sort of a status or a gravity to them. So if most people think, for example, homophobia is wrong, by all means, let's have a law about homophobia. So it's not right or wrong. It's merely that's what the law does, is it basically institutionalizes social values up to a point. Uh, and there may well be abstract ideas about what is a good law or what is a bad law, but a good law is one that has legitimacy that people would follow, that basically is acceptable to most, uh, that is fairly implemented. So, so basically the gap that basically Hart and others noted was that, you know, public morality basically often exists in a sort of an odd angle uh, to, to, to the law. Uh, the other example that Hart gives is basically there are loads of laws on the books in the United States about sexuality. In various United States, there are laws against, uh, you know, kind of certain sexual acts between, between people of the same sex. Nobody ever removed those laws. They're dead letter legislation, but nobody would ever dream putting somebody through the courts for those. However, when homosexuality was decriminalized, the courts very quickly reinvented uh, existing laws to turn them, if you will, as machines for persecuting homosexual people. So, for example, an offence against public morals, which was a law created in the aftermath of the English Civil War, Cromwell's time, was basically now reconstituted as an act of, of you know, it basically it could be used to prosecute people who were seen to be affectionate with one another, say a same-sex couple who were affectionate with one another. So, in other words, basically you can decriminalise homosexuality, but if everybody's homophobic, you've still got to deal with that. So there is this kind of, if you will, dance between social norms in a sociological sense, which do evolve over time, and basically social values. Uh, and then there are societies like the United States where there are two different if you will, codes on the knife edge. Uh, and then basically, so it's, it's always going to play out very, very complicated. So yes, you'd have a, a crisis of the moment and op-eds on this, but I think the longer direction of travel is basically that as we, we think or conceptualize ourselves in different ways, and, and there are many other kind of utopian aspects to the idea of a therapeutic self I haven't touched upon. Uh, you know, I talked to my daughter who's uh, who's 20 uh, and, and uh, you know, she basically is very interested in transhumanism as, as, a, a, as a utopian idea. Won't it be great when we can upload our bodies? You know, uh, there are other people who basically look at trans rights, transgender rights in a very utopian way. They may not be trans themselves, but they just see the, the possibilities it opens up for individuals as something that basically all human beings should celebrate. Yeah. So so basically you will see you, you will see ideas about what it is to be human evolve and change over time. At the same time, you won't see the old ones go away. And it may well be that basically kind of religious codes of public morality based on religious conceptions of good and evil uh, continue to influence us in our thinking about what it is, you know, what we should be doing in society. Uh, so these are ongoing struggles. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of see we're in the middle of a process. Uh, we've seen huge changes even in the last 10 years. I mean, I think changes that nobody would have anticipated the speed of them in terms of the shifts of debate. But these have been percolating, I think, according to the literature anyway. They've been percolating for a very long time. So percolating for a long time and then suddenly as if all at once, but percolating for percolating perhaps since Rousseau, since Freud, since Nietzsche, uh, 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 and so on and so on and so on. And certainly since the 90s. I mean, if you think about it, the current generation of people who engage in identity politics are the grandchildren of the people Tom Wood for writing about with their GSOL clinics and their identities and their age of Aquarius. So we're already three or four generations into this. So it is quite fascinating from that point of view. Thank you, uh, Brian. We, we had a question from Irla there, uh, Irla Watson, um, but you may have kind of partially answered it already um, on your thoughts on the self as a con constantly changing, continuous project and how that, you know, fluidity might link to notions of public morality. And maybe maybe some of the things you mentioned just there, such as, you know, the transhumanist views and even the metaverse where you know, taking that seriously for a moment, we see the possibility of literally deciding what we look like on a given day, how we sound on a given day, or, you know, a bit how we present ourselves to other people might be completely up to us and completely changeable uh, on a given day, um, if that's our main method of communication. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you know, makes me, make, makes, all this makes me want to reach for my St. Augustine, uh, because, uh, you know, from, the point of, from another point of view, a dystopia. Um, I mean, I think that's the point of it. It is, it is kind of a, one, one person's utopia is another person's dystopia. And there's a big difference between the idea of the care of the self and a project of the self and, and curating one's own moral self. Uh, you know, and you can draw, if you are philosophically inclined, as I guess some of us are here today, you can draw basically on, on Augustine, but you could also draw on Nietzsche and find within the writings of these great thinkers, you know, tools for basically helping you with that. Uh, 
you know, the idea that the self is this totally rudderless thing that Mark Zuckerberg will decide what our possibilities are. I, I, I think that's problematic. Uh, I, I, I actually, when I saw the thing from the metaverse, it just made my skin crawl. Uh, because the thing of it is, is that, uh, but, but nevertheless, it will have a sociological impact. I mean, you know, if you think about it, if people, if people learned about how to think about the self from reading St. Augustine, which very few have done, or Nietzsche, which many perhaps claim to have done, maybe fewer have actually done. But, but, but everybody, every child of six is going to have an idea that they can think of themselves uh, and their, the self and the body as entirely different things. That basically, in other words, they're, they're, they're be shaped by a bunch of norms that have severely or incredibly influenced how, how they think of ontology. And that will then basically frame how they get to think, you know, it will, it will generate, I'm sure, great possibilities. But I think also it would be very alienating uh, for many as well. And I think it might send many back scurrying back to, to kind of religious ideas and other ideas that offer to ground them in certain ways. I mean, you know, there are many reasons why people are, are, are drawn towards religious ideas, but people like structure, you know, people like structure. I think of, when I think of, when I want to explain Augustine, somebody who hasn't read Augustine, I say, think of Alcoholic Anonymous, because the entire uh, prayers and approach and model of, uh, is Augustine's approach, it's Augustine's model. It's about a sort of surrender to the higher power. It's, uh, you know, so basically this is a tool that humans could use. And, you know, I, I imagine that humans will always use such tools. Uh, to basically help them get over problems that they have with themselves. But the idea that all problems are located outside the self isn't helpful. Of course, it's a matter of both. I think it's both. I, I, I think there are certain things that basically, you know, thinking of ourselves as people with agency, thinking of ourselves as people with moral responsibility can only be good for us because it basically allows us to develop and mature and to grow and to take responsibility. Uh, and then on the other hand, there are certain things that are clearly not in our individual control and that we can't be blamed for. And different people will draw the line in different places. But and depending on where you draw the line, you're more likely to be left or right in your thinking. You know, you're more likely to think of agency as the main thing. So therefore, be, book, up, book up your game, book up your thinking and do more agency, you know, or, or basically it's all their fault. Uh, it's the structure thing. So let's change society. Let's rewire society. Uh, so, so those ideas are always going to be a play in some direction. So I don't think I've, I've dealt with Irla's question, except to say that, uh, that I think that, that the, the example of the metaverse, it just shows you how, how basically this thinking can move along so quickly. But just imagine a world where, you know, I watched a child, a kind of uh, my brother's grandchild, kind of crawl towards a cell phone. You know, the baby's first steps or baby's first crawl. You know where they start to crawl forward when they're actually going backwards. So the poor child was trying to get to the shiny cell phone. You know, by the time the child is 10, will they basically have access to the metaverse? Will they be thinking of themselves basically as, as, as creatures without bodies, as we do? Or, or, or will that be a language that they can use to help think about how they conceptualize the world? In other words, just as basically you might be aware of a certain kind of phenomenology. Well, this is kind of anti-phenomenology. This is worlds without phenomenology, you know, as in, it's worlds of minds. It's it kind of the, the critics of this would say that you go back to a very, very simplistic sort of Cartesianism, that you have minds and you have bodies and you can do anything with your body and the mind exists entirely independently of the body. Whereas many scientists, philosophers and others would argue that we are in part our bodies. We experience the world through our bodies, to, to our frail bodies, to our sick bodies, to our sore bodies. Uh, we experience the phenomenal world in that way, to touch to sense memory, uh, to, you know, sensory perception, motor intentionality, all these ideas that this is the, how does the mind connect with the world? The mind doesn't exist when the body goes, you know? So complicated issues that people would take very different views on, but that I think that, the, the, that these ideas are not going to go back into the box and they will continue to influence the relationship that an individual has as a, an entity with the state, with society. So if we live in the metaverse and we can change the room and we don't like it, and I, if I'm talking to you and don't like how you look, Des, and can change your shirt from a denim shirt to a paisley shirt, just so it looks better for me. And I expect that degree of control over the world the whole time. That certainly schools me in something, you know? That certainly has an impact. So I can change how you look when I talk to you. You don't even, you don't get to, you don't, you get, I don't have no autonomy of how I look to you. you know, so, so there are all these things as well. It's, it's quite complicated. Uh, but it's going to be ongoing, that's for sure. And it's certainly going to influence basically how we think of things such as harm. Uh, so the idea that psychological harm can be exerted by people who don't intend this to us by merely them existing and coming into our, 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 our line of sight, uh, 
Uh, that strikes me as implausible in some respects. And the other level, entirely plausible, because yes, there are consequences of being exposed to these other things. Uh, and I think there'd be an awful lot of teasing through what that means, uh, whether it's by lawmakers, philosophers, uh, or just ordinary people going about their business. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's, uh, again, fascinating. Um, I think uh, I don't see any further questions in the chat. And um, I, I, I think you've answered those questions incredibly well. I, I might I might pose one more if that's if that's OK for you. Um, so I, one thing I wondered is, and this it, it brought out by your what, what you said, do you think or to what extent do you think that ideas from academia feed into uh, public debates and concept, but you know, so so you mentioned the relationship between law and morality. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, what about the relationship between ac academic uh, conceptualization and theory and public debate? Do you think that which 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 way does the direction go, or do you, do you think that academic debate has an influence on public debate, or does it re does it reflect it, or or or, or what? I think that's an interesting question. Well, both. I mean, insofar as when new things come along and enter into academia. So think of terms of postmodernism. Think of Judith Butler, for example. I mean, Judith Butler would be the, the, the way in which most people would be theoretically engaging with a lot of ideas about identity politics now. Butler is a very difficult and impenetrable writer. You couldn't imagine somebody being more obscure in terms of how they present their arguments. Uh, in the book I'm working on, I, I quote Judith Butler, but to find a lucid quotation from her, one that I thought cogently expressed what she was trying to say, I had to go back to a 1986 essay she wrote. In other words, you could absolutely follow it line by line. It wasn't overtly complicated. It was something she wrote about Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, so yes, I mean, oh, ideas do matter in that sense. Uh, I, 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 and, certainly, and certainly we sort of see them kind of entering the culture. Uh, you know, people like uh, kind of pretty much pretty much everybody in this game has kind of engaged in some way with the idea. Where does how do we talk about how intellectual ideas and philosophical ideas and books kind of enter into the collective consciousness or the general conversation? Uh, you know, uh, Charles Taylor in his book certainly does this. I mean, he talks about collective consciousness. He talks about the ways in which ideas. He was, it's a very long book. He writes. It's, there's a lot on it and how ideas enter the culture. So I would say, yes, ideas become a currency for talking about things. There are ways of talking about things that were very rare in 1990 that are pretty much breakfast conversations now, depending on the house you're in. You know, uh, so, you know, postmodernism, which was a very new thing once upon a time, it's pretty much embedded in every aspect of our culture and entertainment at this stage. So, yeah, I, I, I do think that ideas percolate and find their way into society in various different kinds of ways, but not in the narrow way of just people you know, teachers, teachers there, they have a certain ideological view and they're laying down those ideas to you and then they're leading the youth astray or something. I don't think it's like that. I think it's more about the general mentality of the era, uh, kind of certain concepts that flow well, certain things that certain things tend to speak to certain things, certain ideas get taken up yeah. and, and find their way into, into very general conversations. Um, so yes, I, I think ideas do matter. So a lot so, of the things I'm talking about by means of writers like Augustine or Nietzsche, and I was going through text by text and quote by quote, as you would do for an academic piece, you know, they're, 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 these are kind of, they're speaking to things I think that ordinary people also grasp and engage and deal with, or yeah. have percolated into society. So do you think it matters then? So there's a complaint that you might, you, you'll be very well aware of that ac ac academics are not representative politically of people, you know, that, there's the, the, that the conservatives are underrepresented in academia. Do you think that there's some substance to that complaint if it's also true that academic ideas do have this impact? Well, it depends what you mean. I mean, I went to a, a Catholic school for gosh, 18 years and I'm not even vaguely religious, but at the same time, I have an immense fondness for liking of, liking towards an interest in, in the Catholic universe. So I have appreciation of that, that I think would be, you know, I, I'd be very sad if I, if I didn't have that. Uh, so yeah, I, I, think, I think basically pretty much any culture offers up ways of thinking that become the vehicle through which all the the usual human predicaments are filtered yeah so if you were basically living in albania in 1980 and you wanted to talk about how many tractors we needed that year you'd, you'd have to put the word dialectical materialism into every paragraph of your report if you were writing a report on, on the education system in ireland in 1950 you'd be mentioning papal encyclicals if you were writing in 1990 you'd be mentioning oecd reports there always are but there's always certain forms of knowledge that have status but the, the point you make about, yes, in the social sciences, of course, people, the people are much more likely to be liberals in that broad sense. And the reason is, is that those very disciplines are about the study of social structure. 
uh, and, 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 and kind of, in other words, they're, they're, they're engaging with the very ideas that basically, you know, if I'm a sociologist, you'll find not that many right-wing sociologists because a, a, a kind of a right-wing sociologist would say there's no such thing as social structure and then they wouldn't be a sociologist anymore. So yeah, there are disciplines that study society uh, and many others as well. And now, do I like monocultures? I don't. And I would hate to, I, I would hate to think that any academic department you know, was somehow a monoculture where there weren't people who, who didn't hold different views. So in other words, basically, in a school of philosophy, you'd expect analytical, continental philosophers, you might have a Thomist on your hands and so on and so on and so on. But you're teaching philosophy, you can do that. In a social science department, it's sometimes harder. It may, is everybody a card carrying woke liberal, you know? I, 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 I would certainly prefer to see a scenario where there were more people with divergent views. I would like to see basically people studying social justice from a Christian or Islamic perspective alongside people who are studying social justice, uh, you know, with reference to postmodern theory or, or Marxism or something else. Uh, you know, I, I, and I would like students to have access to all of this. So, yeah, I think there's a bit of a conversation to be had about viewpoint diversity on the campus. And it's certainly something to watch, but it's become more politicized in the United States, I think, than ever here. Uh, I think here in Ireland, we're on such a rapid journey uh, that maybe we haven't taken stock of this. But I would like to think that into the future, that uh, basically our different departments had people who didn't just have religious or secular values, but basically you know, were, were engaged in studying and teaching about different ontological things. And I was offering offering analyses of different ways that human beings have created to think about certain things. Now, there are, of course, different ones, like economics teaches a very different story about than, than say, sociology does. Uh, sociology basically talks about people at the level of the aggregate, uh, whereas psychology is entirely about the person as an individual. So that's viewpoint diversity as well. Very, very different ways and even different languages for talking about the same phenomenon. Uh, so basically, we do have that to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, and I would love to see more of it, and I would hate to see uh, 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 this declining. Uh, at the same time, I, 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 I do see that the campus can become very politicized, certainly in the newspapers and so on. Uh, and, and, and I would sort of say the argument there in the longer game is patience with academic freedom. Patience with allowing scholars to do their own thing, not trying to shoehorn everybody into a, a certain ideological agenda, even if it's perceived as a very progressive and useful, socially useful one. Uh, and allowing cranky people the chance to come and teach their classes and draw their paychecks if they're good at what they do. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Brilliant. Uh, well, I, I think we'll, we'll 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 wrap it up there. Then I, I think we've you, you, it's, we've come to half past five, and you've had a few questions. I just want to say how wonderful it was to have you as a speaker. Um, the talk was incredibly stimulating and bracing and interesting, and it's been fantastic to hear you respond to questions as well. So. Uh, I'm very grateful to you, and um, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for the opportunity. As I say, this is the early stages of a project I'm working on, which will hopefully be a book called Public Moralities. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.